Thank you, Miss Mitchell. Well, if you need a handout tonight, if you'd raise your hand, the ushers will come and give you one. If you need a handout, raise your hand. And as we continue in our series on the top 10 ways to ruin your children, if you don't have any children of your own, then you can look for some others to ruin. <clears throat> Plenty of children around First Baptist Church, and you can ruin as many with this series as you possibly can get your hands on, right? No, 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 no. Top 10 ways to ruin your kids. We continue on with number five tonight. In that handout as well, you'll find a prayer sheet from First Baptist Church. I would encourage you. I would remind you that we ought to be praying for one another. And the full prayer sheet, of course, can be found online. And the, the, you'll see the current prayer sheet. There are some continuing requests that will be online. And then some requests from church uh, family, extended family members. So if you call in and say, well, my uncle is sick. We pray for him. That's absolutely acceptable. We'd love to add them to the list. But the prayer list inside the bulletin that will be handed out on Wednesday nights will be just the current family, church family prayer request. So that's what you see there. The full list, of course, you can find online at the bottom of the page. And then on the back is an update on the missionary we're praying for, uh, the missionaries for this next week, and then an update from a missionary prayer letter. Looking forward to a missionary or mission conference this summer, a little different format for us at First Baptist Church. In years past, we would have taken a missions month, the month of June, and uh, done a number of Sundays and Sunday nights and Wednesday nights and then so Tuesday with missionaries. And this particular summer, we're doing like a little different format. And we'll have some more information as we get closer, but we'll have some time in here as a church family with the missionaries that are coming in and we'll talk to them and then we'll um, have a special speaker on that Tuesday night to present some missions concepts to us and I'll be giving and sharing my heart and philosophy of missions so we can all be unified as we try to reach the world for Jesus Christ. All right, our, our territory or our place of service in that regard starts right here. All right, and for you, it starts next door, right? maybe even inside your house, those who are unsaved, the next door, and, and neighbors, and then uh, co-workers. But our call is to reach the world with the gospel, and one way, one method we reach the world is to support, is to support other missionaries. Another method is to send missionaries as well from this church. And we're excited that, that uh, brother, brother Eric and Miss Jackie... We'll, be, we'll eventually this fall be headed off to Cambodia, the good Lord willing. And uh, they'll be sent here from First Baptist Church. And then a little while after that, this, this fall, we'll also be adding a one-year missionary internship of Austin Cowling. And then Radi Rupel, by that point, she'll be Radi Cowling. And they'll serve with us just for one year as a missionary internship. And no longer than that, not, not a day longer than one year. And then they'll be on the road to deputation, and Lord willing, and in a short time after that, um, they'll be also heading off the field. And we're looking for the Lord to call many to missions. And so that's another way. And so we support and uh, we send and we give. Right? That's another way we give. All right? Not just as a church, but individually we give. And then we go, whether locally or where the Lord calls us on. So that's just for the missions. If you have your notes now, have your Bibles, you can turn to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 22 tonight. Proverbs chapter 22. As we continue in our series, the top 10 ways, top 10 ways to ruin your children. Now, we have gone through four. The very first week, I got very, uh, uh, very courageous and thought I could go through two in one night. That's impossible. There's no way. There's no way. So now I have just resigned myself to the fact uh, that we will just do one per evening, but this will take us right to where missions, Lord willing, the timing on that. And I hope it's been a blessing to you. A number of you have stopped and commented or called or texted me and said that you've been helped through this. And I hope, I hope you've been helped as we look at God's word and try to identify some ways, identify some ways that maybe we're not doing the best job as parents that we can be doing. I'm not here to tell you that you're all failing, all right, because we know there's four key principles. Every week we've gone over them. Let's go over them real quick. It's in red there. <clears throat> on, your, on your handout. Four principles. Very few people are trying to ruin their children. There are a few out there, but very few are trying to. I would add a little caveat, but some are. Some are. All right? Very few are trying, but some are. And some have done a good job at ruining them. So we're trying to avoid here. Number two, we are all going to make mistakes. Every single one of us. We're all going to make mistakes. There's none of us that are going to be perfect inside this thing called parenting. No matter how hard <coughs> we try, 
No matter what, we do all make mistakes. Number three, we must realize and correct our tendencies, actions, and attitudes and make corrections. And I'm going to grab a drink of water or I will die tonight. Okay, I'm alive again. Boy, we'll see. It's caught right here. <laughs> if I get stuck, um, Leanne, you come finish, all right? Don't worry about your husband. You can come finish it. All right. All right, no problem there. Anybody know CPR? Let me die, all right? Say nice things. <laughs> no, put your hand down. <laughs> Don't touch me. I'm, so I'll survive. Number four, God brings practical truth and help from Scripture to our parenting. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Let's pray tonight as we begin. Lord, help, help us tonight as we look at your word, as we look at this next principle. <laughs> Lord, help us to see ways and areas that we are not pleasing you as we parent our children. Lord, we need your help in this regard. We need your wisdom, we need your strength, we need your understanding. Lord, guide this time, give me the strength, Lord, give me the wisdom as, we, as I speak and Lord, would your word touch us and change us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, there we go. Number five. Number five. If you want to ruin your kids, then let your kids determine how they are raised. If you want to ruin your kids, just let them raise themselves. You say, well, pastor, I would never do that. Are you kidding? They're young, and I have them a good place to stay. And I provide for them. Roof over their head and toilet paper and heat and water and food. <coughs> well, I want to talk tonight about uninvolved parents. I may not make it. It may be a short one. If that's the case, well, God bless you. Bedtime, who decides? Who decides? Well, I know who's supposed to decide. All right, mom's tired. Everyone's tired, right? Bedtime. Food choices. Food choices. Who decides? Wow. Friend choices. Who decides what chores are done around the house? Who decides? I have seen, observed some families where the mom is doing everything around the house and she has teenage children around the house. Who decides? I've seen homes where dad's doing everything outside the house <coughs> and has teenage kids. This is not just for the, uh, for the saved. This is also for the unsaved. There's an idea out there. I had written through this and worked through this and then even did some study in a secular way. What does it look like to have uninvolved parents? And this is what unsaved, unsaved people say about uninvolved parents or what a family or home looks like when a parent doesn't raise the children. All right? Here's what they say. The parents will act emotionally distant from their children. Boy, I remember years ago, I'm on a mission trip, youth pastor at First Baptist Church. <clears throat> we're in Canada. We're in Canada, and we go to a mall. While we're at the mall, some of the, the young people buy something. They come up to me, and they begin to show me all the things that they bought at the mall. They show me what they bought, the deals they got, and kind of took a step back from that situation that day, kind of like an out-of-body experience, right? I'm listening to them. I'm thinking, you know, in one sense... I don't care what they bought. I could care less what a seventh grade girl bought in the mall. But in another sense, I really care. Because I care about them. Got that day, I went beyond that. I'm saying they're listening to what they bought, and, and I forget what these, these young girls and, and guys had bought. <clears throat> Didn't really matter. But I remember thinking about maybe this one right here, whose parents, in my opinion, and there, what they told me before, would never listen to them about that stuff. In this time, it was a short conversation, but you know how sometimes your mind kind of races very quickly? I remembered that season when I had coached the soccer team. I'd seen soccer games. 
And now, years later, volleyball and soccer games, the parents emotionally uninvolved with their kids. I understand that some have work obligations and you can't necessarily make every single game. But there are parents who are letting them kid, their kids raise themselves, act emotionally distant from their children, provide little or no supervision, set few or no expectations or demands for behavior. In our house, we have expectations and demands on behavior. Oh, you're one of those parents. You better believe it. You better believe it. I am. I expect my kids to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. Well, isn't that a little old-fashioned? I'm not sure. I never looked it up. And I really don't care. I believe it shows respect. I have an expectation and a, and a demand in the house. In our house, we have expectations on behavior and how they treat each other. Right, that's okay. But one rule that I have instituted in the house is if your sibling asks you to stop, you're supposed to stop. Right, you know that the kids like to irritate each other? Now my, my brother Joe is here tonight. He's coming back here, moving back here to, to the Bridgeport area. And uh, I think, uh, well, don't do this. Don't waste your time. But if you were to ask Joe, you'd find out, my brother Joe, you'd find out that I was a perfect sibling. Don't waste your time asking him, okay? Don't waste your time. It's not even worth it. Another brothers, they're, they're around. Don't ask them either. But I'm sure they'd all say the same thing. I'm positive. I mean, I couldn't think of any other answer they would give you except, oh, yeah, perfect. You know? And probably a little bit like with that attitude, too. Because sometimes they had bad attitudes. But as one of seven kids, there were times that my siblings would try to irritate me. Maybe I did as well, perhaps. But in our house, an expectation we have of your sibling asks you to stop, you're to stop. The only place that doesn't hold true, there's one area that I said you cannot ask this, is, is my kids like to sing. All right, and they'll be singing, and sometimes they'll be singing like right in the morning. Thank you, Pastor Kelly. That's, that, that's probably for me, I'm guessing. I appreciate that. I'm not even going to ask what it is. Thank you, sir. If I start to, no. I'm <laughs> My kids like to sing, and sometimes I'll have one of them singing in the mornings, right? And right when they wake up, they're singing, and another one's like, can you please, Dad, please, tell, tell James to stop singing. Tell Dad James, I asked him to stop six times. And I'm like, Johnny, I mean, I'm not, you know, I'm just using hypothetical names. Johnny, your brother can sing in the mornings. Yes, sir. <laughs> expectations. But you know that some parents don't have expectations on their kids. They're letting them raise themselves. Uninvolved, according to the secular source, provides little warmth, love, and affection towards children. Your kids need, my kids need warmth, love, and affection shown to them from mom and dad. They are craving that warmth, love, affection, and attention. They want someone to listen to them, to, to say, listen, I'm proud of you. I love you. Boy, you did just a great job. Now, don't lie to your children. I don't lie to my children. I don't lie to them. If, but listen, you can compliment them. Nothing wrong with that. Boy, that's really good. Boy, the way you handled that, the way you... And listen, man, it, it, what do you want to talk about? I have the privilege of, of usually driving my kids to school. And I'll ask them, what do you want to talk about? What do we need to pray about today? What's on your agenda today? And the kids bring something in their unique sense, in their unique world. I'm happy to hear what they want to talk about. Drove Danielle home tonight from school. Danielle, what do you want to talk about? Man, she, and she is truly an intelligent young lady. And I have support for that when she said, well, let's talk about how handsome you are, Daddy. <laughs> right, honey? And she's intelligent, yes. Intelligent girl. Intelligent. I think the Lord's going to use her. I really do. I just got a sense. I got a sense. 
me give you some thoughts on why, there's some blanks there on why, on why we let kids raise themselves. Five blanks there. First one, sometimes it's negligence. Sometimes parents are just, the word there, deadbeats. Sometimes parents are just deadbeats. My heart goes out for those children. There are some parents who are deadbeats. Unfortunately, if I've been here for 20 years, unfortunately, occasionally, once in a while, great while, you even see it around the church family and school. Now, we're blessed with some wonderful parents here. Don't think I'm sitting here as you're all deadbeats, but I unfortunately have seen it even here in my time in the school and youth pastor where I'm like, wow, honestly, according to anyone's definition, you as a mom or a dad, you're just a deadbeat. You hate that. Sometimes it's negligence. But, but in, our, in our situation, that's not as common, though it does sometimes happen. It does. Your heart breaks for that. I am pleased to say that in some of those circumstances, there are other people in the church who have come to me in that regard as principal, as youth pastor, say, listen, Pastor J.D., if there's something that we can do for so-and-so, let us know. Great church family we're a part of, great church family. But that's not as common. But, but number two here, number two happens more often than we care to admit. admit. Number two, tiredness. Tiredness. Listen, you work a lot of hours. Being a parent is not for the faint at heart. That, to, to tell on myself, there are a couple of times I can remember where I'm in Walmart and I should have walked out of Walmart with my child and taken care of a problem, but I was plumb tired. And the cart was full. And I'm on my way to the checkout. You know what? Forgive me, I'm going to be a bad parent for about five minutes. I'm not excusing them to explain the situation. I'd like to say that every time that I need to deal with that, that I put the stuff back on the shelf and walk my child out and come back inside. But there are a couple of times I remember, listen, I was just tired. Just tired. Sometimes tiredness causes parents to be, uh, uh, to, to be uninvolved in the way they're supposed to be. I'm too old to raise a child. I work all the time. Tiredness. Tiredness may bring understanding, but tiredness is no excuse. If God gave us this tremendous gift, then he'll give us the understanding and the strength. And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season shall reap if we faint not. So apparently you may be tired tonight, but don't throw in the towel. The stakes are too high. The calling is too great. Negligence, tiredness. Number three, sometimes ignorance. Sometimes it's ignorance. There are times that a parent because, is uninvolved because they just don't know any better. Well, this is what I'm trying to do in these, in these sessions, are I not? Trying to bring some understanding, some teaching, some help to the situation. I would submit that in 2021, it is hard to claim ignorance as a valid excuse. There are too many tools, too many ways that we can be equipped as a Christian, as a husband, as a wife, as a parent, as a grandparent... As a child of God, there are too many ways to say, I didn't know. But yet we've been using that excuse since grade school. How about this one, parents? I didn't hear you. So when you were standing this far from my face, and when we were shaking your head up and down and saying, yes, sir, what do we call that? Oh, that's what you meant. <laughs> yes, yes, that's exactly what I meant. Come on, am I the only parent like that? Come on, anybody else? Come on, Brother Treadway, come on, I, I, does that ever happen in your house? No, it doesn't. No, no, <laughs> yeah, sure. Ignorance. Unfortunately, the, the kids have been allowed inside of that ignorant excuse method, and then now it's parents, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know. 
No excuse. No excuse in 2021. There are too many, too many great helps out there. In fact, we have ordered books. We ordered them a while ago. They're on back order. We're going to have some books available for parents. And if you want further help, we have some books that you can purchase. I also will have a small book for every parent in this room uh, when we get the, at, the, at, the, at the last session, the last one. In fact, I have enough. If other people want one as well, you know someone else who wants one, I'm sure I have enough to give those away. Too many ways to be equipped. You can jump onto YouTube. There are podcasts. There are blogs. There are books. There's, there's sermons you can listen to and teaching that, that you, you can go to. And, and ignorance is no excuse. Number four. Number four. One that creeps in the back door. One that perhaps you may be guilty of. Sometimes it's reactionary. Sometimes it's reactionary. Well, I remember my parents, and I am angry at the way I was raised. Therefore, for my kids, now I'm not saying that you shouldn't um, take good and maybe change some things for your parents. If, if no parent's perfect, all right, my kids will have some things they picked up for me that are imperfect. I hope they change those things. I hope they don't repeat the imperfections. But I have seen people, I'm sure you've seen people, who are reacting and, and maybe against true hurt, I'm not saying it's all make-believe, but they're living in bitterness, they're living in anger, and because of that, they raise their kids inside of that. And now they're, they're parents who had a number of good benefits, well now they are not doing anything. And lastly, number five, sometimes it's because of insecurity. I'm afraid they won't like me. It was my first week or so of school as principal. I was youth pastor before. Youth pastor fun. Principal, more fun. Mom called. They're no longer here. Kids are no longer so I can use this and, and they, can go on, on, they can go on live stream. I'm okay with that. Mom called. Pastor JD, this is so-and-so. Yes, ma'am. Would you please tell my daughter to change her skirt this morning? Now, this was before school had started, around the 8 to 8.05 mark. We, had a, we have a rule, not had a, we have a rule in our school about the length of a skirt, skirts that the girls must wear to school. Right? you got to have those rules or else everyone interprets differently. And we have one. And so she called and said, would you please tell my daughter to change her skirt this morning? The skirt she's wearing is too short. And I didn't want her to tell, tell her to change it at home. Now that's wrong on a lot of levels. I answered this way, the Lord helped me that day. I said, well, Miss so-and-so, I will do that because that is my job as principal. But as a parent, you also should be instructing your daughter in the way that you want her to dress as well. Question, pop quiz time. Who do you think was making the decisions about dress in that house? Parents or kids? Kids. Not rocket science, is it? And when that young lady came to school, dropped off by, believe, her father, right, because mom had called me, um, I told her, well, that skirt's too short, you have to go change it. And she had a bad attitude and like mad at me for a little bit. That's fine. As principal, you endure that. And I, not my favorite part of the job, but you have to do that. This is the rule. We got to stick to it. Insecurity. Don't want kids to not like you. You know, parent, please think about this and understand this. They will dislike you more for not being a parent. I have seen it time and time again with children and authority. Remember years ago I had to come after, not come after, but I had to deal with a student. I had to deal in a pretty stout manner. A stout manner in regards to, to sports and school. And I thought, I thought my relationship with this student, this particular young person, would forever be tarnished by the situation I had to deal with. But understand as a, as a principal as a youth pastor I don't believe I have the luxury to pick and to choose I've got to obey the Lord and be faithful to to him right 
Imagine my surprise when about six months later, this student really got right with God. And they came to me. They said, Pastor J.D., would you, would you hold me accountable in my devotions and walk with God? I was shocked. I was shocked because I believed by having to be so, so stout, not me, not a jerk, but so firm in this, that, that they would not want to have any other relationship with me. I could see why they would become bitter because I would be the front end of the blunt instrument. I was so shocked that I said, listen, I said, you, you got to help me. I asked him, I said, remember, I, I did this. I had to do this. Remember this? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> of course, how could, they not, how could they not remember that, right? I said, then, then why, why, why are you asking me? And they said, Pastor D, because of that, I really saw how much you cared for me. That was before I had children. And listen, parent, don't miss this. Insecurity will drive you away from your children. You think it'll drive you closer to your children. Well, I'll be the good guy. I'll be the friend. I'll be the cool parent. And I'll never say no. And they will raise themselves. You think in that insecurity, it'll make you closer. But in reality, it will drive you farther away. And there are some in here, or some listening, you think, you know what, Pastor Howell? You're an idiot. It's not true. Mark my words. Mark my words. It is true. All right, my job is not to just be a friend to my child. I'm not called to be their best friend. I'm called to be their father. Right? That's called to be their father. And with that, I have some responsibilities. Let me give you some thoughts on the deceptive thought inside of this. How do we permit this behavior? First of all, sometimes we just give in. We give in at first blank with excessive loud behavior. A child yells long enough, we give in. If they ask enough times, we give in. And we teach them by that giving in that a no doesn't really mean no. It means ask 23 and a half more times and then the no becomes yes. In our house, we do have a little policy that, if, that you're not allowed to like, ask both the parents and play both parents against each other. It's a great policy. All right? So they try, the kids try this sometimes. Even my kids are little pagans sometimes. Right? And they think, they think we can't hear in the house. Right? I, I can hear them or Doreen can hear them in the back. And they'll ask me, hey, can I have a snack? And it's, it's usually not something life and death. They're usually like, like a snack. Like they're hungry. And mom will say, hey, wait till supper. I'll say, wait till supper. And wouldn't you know it? Those little pagans go back to their parent, right, and say, hey, mom, or hey, dad, can I have a snack? Followed usually by one of us saying, um, I think you just asked me that question. Uh, uh. Told you about the family pictures before, family pictures that we took. Love the three stages of family pictures. Every family picture we ever took had the same three phases. Beautiful outfits, coordinating usually. Sometimes an animal involved as well. So cute. All right, everyone's just sitting there just smiling. You should go back and look at some of our first family pictures. You'll look at James and you'll see, wow, he's laughing. That's cute. He's not laughing. He's crying his head off. <laughs> Thankfully, my wife and I are good enough at Photoshop that he looks like he's laughing. And the tears are gone and he's actually, he's, he is not happy that day. First stage in family pictures where parents begin to threaten their children. Sit still. You sit still right here, right now. You smile. You smile. No, you're a real smile. You're, you're a real smile. Like, like I can't hear them five feet away, right? You smile right now. Just have to act like nothing's happening. This is neat. But it's not over yet. Phase two, stage two, bribery. Always happens. Always happens, Bribery. If you sit still, we're going to McDonald's. You like ice cream, McDonald's ice cream, big ice cream cone. Ooh. Talk, talking about parents, you, you can be storytellers. During that bribery time, you're describing, I mean, I'm getting hungry sitting there taking pictures. I'm like, if I sit still, do I get an ice cream cone? I learned, though, that's not the end. The last stage was always my favorite. 
Because then I knew we're about three, four minutes from being done. So you have threatening, you have bribery. But my favorite stage, the last stage, was when parents would begin to threaten about the bribery. If you don't sit still, there would be no ice cream for you. And we knew you have nothing left. All right, we are done. One time, family pictures. One time, I remember this. Family was all there, and one of the children decided not to come over for family pictures. Come over here. No. That's awkward. Stand there with the camera. Well, I've got 15 minutes left. 13. And they finally came at their own time, their own pace. Parents gave in. That's when a child's raising themselves. Remember another time. Well, let me, let me go on. Number two. Number two. We allow stubbornness. A child learns how far to push it. How far to push it. Remember, years ago, school saw a, a parent trying to get their children, their child's, atten- their child's attention to go home. And they said, so-and-so, come. Come here. Kid acted like they didn't even exist. We're like... The parent is right here, their child's at the pulpit, all right, that distance, and I'm like right here. Come here. Child's just playing. Child was third grade. Is that 10 years old? 10 years old. So we're not talking two or three, 10 years old. Come here. Come here. Come here. Now I'm all in, right? Now I'm kind of like, oh, now I'm an observer. Oh, come here, come here. And finally, the parents said, first name, middle name, come here right now. It was like a light switch. Kid looks up, okay, walks over. They knew that they were fine until first and middle name were used. I learned that that day. I learned that parent did not care at all about obedience or anything until first and middle name were we're used. Now, parents, let me help you here real quick. All right? Your kids are able to come the first time you call them. All right, let me say that again. Your kids are able to come the first time you call them. All right? They're, ab- they're able to. They can be expected to. All right? Now, kids will want to work through different situations. Well, I heard you. I'm coming. I just had to finish. Here, parents, let me help you. You just had to finish nothing. If I call you, you should come right away. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, parents, you ought to be taking notes, at least mentally. You ought to be taking notes because this happens all of the time. If you wonder how your child behaves... Ask the child's teacher. Ask the child's teacher. Ask him. Go to the class and say, Mrs. Allen, how does Danielle behave? And then follow up with, if they don't, tell me right away. Now, what you also find, my wife teaches in a, the public sector. Right? Parents are sometimes different in that regard. I remember walking to my wife's classroom Boy, probably 15 years ago now, down in Mount Morris. And those kids were sitting there, well-behaved, first graders. Because my wife had expectations on them. And enforced when they didn't follow it. We allow the stubbornness if we're not careful. A little word there for you, asking versus instructing. Now, I don't have a problem with asking. I don't want my kids to ever think, though, that that is just an optional question for them. Hey, Johnny, would you mind taking out the trash? No, Dad, I would mind, actually. Why don't you do it? Maybe a kid would try it one time. (laughs) And then he'd say, okay, I'm ready. No. Now, let me give you thoughts about this. Instructing demonstrates authority. Asking demonstrates respect. I believe both are valid in the home. Authority and respect. Both are valid, right? Both are valid. And so I want to treat my children with respect, 
but they must understand that their parents are the authority. <coughs> Last blank there, we tolerate manipulation. When parents are not unified in their approach. One is tough, one is easy. And parents will undermine each other because, oh, well, your mom wouldn't let you have this snack, but, but I'm the cool parent, I'll let you have it. Oh, well, don't tell your father when he gets home. And then we teach them to play that both sides. Let me give you quickly tonight the correct response. It's four verses there, or four passages. <clears throat> Proverbs 1, 8, 9. My son, hear the instruction of thy father and forsake not the law of thy mother. Solomon says, listen, to what your father said, and don't stop doing what your mother said. There's instruction. Son, you're not in this for yourself. You're not in this doing it all yourself. There's a mom and a dad, a mother and a father, all right? And so don't, don't just, don't forsake it. And listen, hear and heed, verse 2, for they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head and chains about thy neck. Let me go to Ephesians 6, 4. We'll come back to Psalm 127. Ephesians 6, 4. And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up just like they want to be brought up. Is that what it says? Bring them up however they feel like it. No. Bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It sounds like, dads, that we should not drive them to anger, but that there is a way to bring them up in, a way to instruct them in, right? Can we, can we see that conclusion from that passage? So they don't get to decide the nurture and admonition of their own way. They get the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's not even my way. It's his way. But there is a way. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself. That's where we're going, that isn't it? A child left to himself. What happens? Brings his mother to shame. Remember, I told you if you want to be the cool parent, you will not prosper in that. So that verse says, there will be shame. It will not end up well. And the Bible is always right. You can do it your own way, but I promise you the Bible is right. And we always prove the Bible right, either by following it and reaping the blessings or by ignoring it and reaping the consequences. But we always prove it to be right. Psalm 127, I skipped over that one. Let's read it though real quick. Lo, lo children are inheritance of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Let me just, and I know I'm, I'm out of time, almost out of time tonight. I brought a bow and arrow tonight. It was only fitting, right? Slingshot, picture, more weapons apparently. Use this for a patch player, all right? So, but I'm not a hunter. I've told you this before, right? Here, John, do you mind again? Please, come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Use you. Perfect. You shouldn't sit so close, my friend. All right, yeah, okay. Don't worry, John. I tried, I tried this before. All right. I'm going to shoot over here. All right, see? Okay. Now, now, are you worried about this if I shoot Brother John? How about you, Carrie? What about now? She, yeah, yeah. Thank you. you yeah. Why is it that we can be more concerned about a play bow and arrow than we are our children? Why is that? You would no sooner want me to just launch this thing towards your family, towards your small child, than, than, than you, you try to protect them. But we get more concerned about a play bow and arrow than we do about directing our children as arrows in the hand of a mighty hunter. Let me go one step further. Men... Talking to the men for a moment here. Some of you are more concerned about gun safety than your children. You would say, hey, son, keep that barrel pointed down. And you ought to teach them gun safety. 
Those of you who were here the night that Brother Golomez helped us on the outdoor night, remember that? Swung that gun around me about five ways past Sunday. Life flashed before my eyes, and we've teased him since then. And staff, we've teased Brother Golomez about, about gun safety. Don't treat a gun more carefully than you treat your children. All right, we get more concerned about bow and arrow and gun safety than we are about directing our children, but the stakes are much higher with our children. I would much rather you not care about gun safety and care more about your children, but I'd like you to care about both. I think you understand that. So let's quit horsing around on this stuff as parents, as dads, as moms as well. Three quick things, the ways to guide. Number one, guide with wisdom. Guide with wisdom. James says, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, which giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not. And I'm glad the verse doesn't end there, because it ends with, and it shall be given him. You don't have enough brain for it? Ask God. And let me state that again, not in the form of a question. You don't have enough brains for it. Ask God. Guide with wisdom. If not, you'll just be reactionary. I'm mad today. House is rough. I had a good day. House is loose. I had these type of parents. House is this way. These, or you'll be ignorant or negligent. Disconnected, uninvolved. Guide with wisdom. Moms and dads. Books, sermons, scripture. Number two, guide with compassion. Guide. Now notice I chose that word guide. I didn't choose the word rule. I chose the word guide. You've been on a tour before? Been on a few tours? Maybe at a tourist attraction. And a guide comes and a guide walks along with you, right? A guide is engaging, are they not? A guide says, oh, that's neat. Hey, look over here. Oh, don't go over there. You shouldn't do that. We, we can't go there. That's off limits. In fact, if you do, they'll lock you up and put you in jail. Right? That's what a guide does. A guide says, we'll go this way. Now, now, look at this. When you're done and you've had a good tour guide, then you can actually explain to someone else what you saw. As parents, we're a guide. Are we not? Guide with compassion. 1 Corinthians 16, 14. Let all your things be done with charity. And number three, guide with stability. Firm, but not mean. Humble, but not weak. Consistent, but not stubborn. That'd be good for parents, be consistent, but not stubborn. Well, bless God, I've never done this ever. You can be consistent. You can be consistent and honestly look and go to the Lord for guidance. It's okay, moms and dads, to change your mind. It's okay to change your mind if directed by the Lord. It's okay to change your mind. Well, I'll have to admit I'm wrong. See rule number four. Don't be emotionally unstable inside of the house. Oh, mom's on a tangent today. Oh, dad had a rough day at work. Last little phrase here. I desire to guide and, my, and direct my children with the wisdom that God has promised to give. We parents are directing something, guiding something a lot more, we're infinitely more important than an arrow or a gun. Let's not spend more time on those things than on what God has called us to. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for this time. Lord, help us as parents. Lord, we're going to fall short sometimes, but your grace is sufficient. Lord, thank you for your wisdom. And Lord, guide us tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.